Right. Good morning, everybody. Hello. So let me open this chat function. We are back at this. Chat is open, and I'm also going to be opening, like always, the Q&A for later on. So while, hey, Linda. So while we are just getting everybody joining in, Vic, hey, hello. Tracy, Mariah, nice seeing all the names again. Um, I'm back. It's been a hell of a ride. Um, lots of stuff on the go. Everything from office to travel to not traveling to personal stuff, just on and on and on. So anyway, this week I'm hosting three webinars, which is pretty cool. Nice being back. Um, I just had an amazing weekend away with zero signal, and that's a win. There is nothing like going away and just having that full-on, just total break. It's been amazing. So this week, just while I'm waiting for everybody to join in, we'll get going. Um, this week, tonight, obviously, we're going to look at Q&A and Lightroom. I've printed out all the questions that you guys have, and we're going to work top to bottom. Just go right through them. At any point in time, if you have any new questions that pop up, then simply drop it in the Q&A, and I'll come and check in there every once in a while. Hey, Maria, good evening. Marie, hi from Miami. So you can drop new questions that you think of in there. And what I will probably be doing in this, love the new, <laughs> thanks, Linda, that was good fun. Um, what I'm going to be doing in this one quite often, I think, is referencing older Lightroom videos. Because some of these questions I will touch on, but um, I'm going to be referencing old stuff. So I'm going to try and answer all of it. What I'm going to do is tomorrow when I get to the office, I'm going to send all of you that were involved in this webinar, I'll send you guys an email. If you have any specific um, videos that you would like, email me and I'll send you the links on email. I'm in the office the whole day tomorrow. So um, we can do that. But I think we are good to go. So, um, like from Q&A. Now, in the chat function for me, as always, just give me an idea here. Um, I, I think I have an idea just based on, um, based on the questions that you guys have asked. On a scale of 1 to 10, your Lightroom knowledge, 1 being I'm pretty new, 10 versus I'm amazing. Where do you currently sit with your Lightroom knowledge? Let me get 3, 7, 5, just get some ideas here. I've got a 6 to a 7. Very new. Okay, that's cool. Two, seven, eight. Okay, cool. Right. So, what are we going to do? Seven, eight. Thanks. Thanks, Tracy. That's cool. Um, we're about four. Okay. So, everything that we're going to cover in here, because I've obviously had to read through these questions, and I'm going to see how deep I can go. But time constraint wise, uh, like I said, I might refer to other videos. And tomorrow you'll get an email from me, and you can just reply on that, and we'll go deeper from there. Any questions that you have that pop up, let me know and we can go from there. So, um, I'm going to start. This is top to bottom. Um, just work from the top all the way down. So, Mori asks, how do I get started importing pics from camera and iPhoto into Lightroom? Camera, I'm going to show you now. Quick one for me in the chat. How many of you have or are currently using iPhoto, the native thing on the Mac, the, the native program? I think it's called Photos Now. How many of you are or ever have used it? Okay. This makes me happy. No, 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 no. There is a yes, no. Okay. So, Murray, what I'm going to do is the problem, don't do Mac, gotcha. So, the problem with iPhoto, just let's go from there, is you copy the images in to Mac, right? And it has a directory, for example, Masamora 2020 which is not happening because of COVID. But anyway, you have a folder, the raw files live in there, okay? iPhoto then has its own database and it doubles up. So if you have, for example, 10 gigabytes worth in your folder, you have another 10 gigs in the database. It is a very resource hungry, very resource hungry program. Now, Maureen, what I need you to do is drop me an email or reply to my email tomorrow, and I'm gonna send you a link where it basically facilitates the transfer of images from iPhoto into Lightroom. Now, Maury, you need to go do a deep dive into all my Lightroom videos because we're going to run through all of this. But there is one or two um, further on. There are one or two more questions on the import process. So I want to take you through that. Once I get there, we'll do the whole one together. Yeah. Okay. Now, um, Melissa asks, how do I blur the background but not the main subject like a lion in the picture? Okay, let's go. We're going to go share my screen, which is Lightroom, and we go here. All right, um, guys, sorry, just in the chat one more time. Confirm for me you can see my Lightroom here, please. Just so you got it. Thank you, Anne. All right, Tracy, thank you. So 
the best way that you can blur the background is not necessarily in Lightroom. The best place to blur the background is um, in, in camera using depth of field. Yeah. So let's choose something like this over here. All right. So this cat was photographed at um, 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 Sabi Sands a couple of weeks ago. So the background blur. Now, if we look at this, right, the background blur you want is that. Yeah. Now that is the result of a very shallow depth of field because of f 2.8. Okay, we need to understand those things. We need to understand depth of field. So, Melissa, I'm assuming you're understanding depth of field and the background blur, but we can fake it a little bit in Lightroom. The easiest way to do this is you're going to work with the texture clarity sliders, right? And a little bit of darkness. It's a play on color. So, for the instances for this one, I'm going to use a radial filter. And guys, if this doesn't make sense, almost every single thing that I'm telling you now has another video that I've done. Ask me an email tomorrow if there's anything, so keep notes. So I'll put this radial filter on. I show my mask. Now red is the area where the effect I'm going to do takes place. We all know this. So I remove the mask. And now I look at, if I drop clarity, I'm going to overdo this just so you can see. Can you see what happens? More clarity, less clarity more clarity, less clarity. So by dropping the clarity, which is actually contrast on the edges, which looks like sharpness, you are making it smoother in the background. All right. So you would kind of drop clarity down. You could drop texture down. And if you look at this image now, and I just turned those on and off there, you've kind of faked a smooth, the background, right? So blurring the background, this is in Lightroom. So, there are other ways to do this in Photoshop. We use a Gaussian blur and you mask it out. But Melissa, this is probably the easiest way in Lightroom to, to get that fake background blur. What you have to be careful of that with this is it's uniform through that whole area. So in something like this, just to get more slightly more technical here, is I would probably in this one urge you to do rather a brush and we paint, uh, where, oh, let me just get this out of the way. And we paint, for example, the background. So we'll do that section, which has the same amount of blur. Then I do a new brush on this because it's already got a, you can't now just go and apply the same thing to everything. Yeah. So these two areas have the similar kind of sharpness and you make another brush for this. So if I then check and I've got which brushes do I have here? So I've got that one. I've got that one. And I've got that one, obviously very rough. And you would then go and blur them each individually slightly differently. Because if you look at something with your eyes, there is still those layers of blur. Yeah. So look, look at where you're sitting now. Look at your computer and just be aware that whatever's behind it is out of focus. So by doing this, you're probably going to get a better result of blurring and kind of playing with those different types of blur. Melissa, I hope that helps. All right, moving on here. Um, Whitney says clarity issues. Now, I'm not sure what a clarity issue, perfect, good stuff, Melissa. I'm not sure what a clarity issue is, right? but let me try this. The clarity slider, right? These three sliders are all based around contrast. The main contrast slider is at the top over here, which makes darks darker and lights lighter throughout the whole image, right? The whole image. If I come down, Texture does contrast around more of a fine version, but around the highlighted areas. Okay. Clarity does edges and contrast edges around the darker areas and dehaze does it in the smooth areas. So what clarity does is, for example, it takes the area here, any edge, any edge. You've got this piece of grass here. So where that piece of grass meets the background, there's an edge, right? Clarity enhances that. Right. So, and it makes it look sharper, but it's not real sharpness. It's fake sharpness. So the problem is with clarity, and this could be an issue for those of you that understand this a bit deeper, is watch what happens to the image when I jack the clarity up all the way. Okay. It becomes quite dark. Ooh, look what it does to the eyes. That's quite neat. So, but the whole image gets quite dark. If you go down, it becomes quite light and it looks really, really bad. Please don't ever do that. Okay. But as a guideline for you guys, and those that have worked with me privately should know this, 
that more or less for every five clarity points that you go up, I would suggest you lift your shadow up by one or two to balance that darkness, that clarity gives. That to me is the main clarity issue. Um, who is this? Whitney, I hope that helps. But clarity as a thing, it's a great slider to use, but please be careful. It can be overdone very, very easily. So clarity issues. I do think I have a video on just clarity. Ask me in the email tomorrow. Okay, we have got here. Um, who's this? Valerie says she doesn't have Lightroom, just an educational viewing for me. Um, Valerie, if you are looking at any kind of images, doesn't have to be wildlife. Lightroom is the easiest thing with which to, um, with which to not only edit images, but catalog as well. Phenomenal. And I'm going to show you a couple of things later on that you can also do with it based on some of these questions. Right. Um, so I've got one here from Hannah it says a simple step-by-step -step flow from SD card shooting raw and JPEG to a meaningful and efficient library and photo storage backup. Now, that kind of links to Maurice, Maurice's question from the beginning. That's a big question. So what I've done, just as a quick one here, is I have got a, um, an SD card attached in here, right? And it is the one that I just shot some drone footage this weekend. So I'm going to fly through this, but um, who is this? Hannah, if you need details on this, please um, let me know. I can send you detailed stuff on it. So, big question. Let's see how fast we can go with this. So, importing from an SD card, the whole flow, and go. So, you put your SD card into your camera, well, from your camera into your laptop. You hit import. This comes up. So, I choose source, which is at the top here, which is my device, and this is all drone footage that's on the SD card that came out of my drone. Right, so I'm just gonna uncheck. So you could bring in everything. I'm just gonna choose something right now. That's a video, I need a picture. So let's do that one. And then you say import. Now, what I'm gonna send you, Hannah, is when you email me tomorrow is what all of this does. Because the short version, and Lightroom makes it this easy for us, is you copy from a card, you copy to somewhere. You basically got an SD card over here and you have to take it from here onto your computer. That is what the dialog does for you. So copy means it takes it from here and it moves it somewhere. So you select the photos, you make sure it says copy and you select the destination. That's the first part of you importing and doing a backup as such of your images. To open this up, you get more details and here you can now select, make a second copy to. Now, what you're saying here is a library and photo storage backup. By default, when you copy, it goes to the directory that you have up here. Okay, you can change this by hitting these two triangles and you can select your new destination. But you can make a second copy. So, if you, for example, have one hard drive where all of your raw files live, you can have a second one attached at the same time. And when you import Lightroom copies from your, 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 your SD card to both destinations. So it's a great way to do backup. Um, Hannah, when you email me tomorrow, I'll send you the video that I've done on importing specifically. That should answer it for you. Just a little bit of side note for you guys here. I had a guy once, and some of you might have heard this, many years ago in Amboseli, I was running a big Cats and Tuskers safari. And this chap came and he had his, every day he came back, he put his laptop in, he put his SD card in. He would then use this function, make a second copy to. So he would copy to one directory and make a second copy to another hard drive. So he would have two hard drives. Yeah. Then when that was finished, he would take another two hard drives, plug them in the other side and duplicate these two over to there. And then he would save his memory card. So this guy had five copies every day of every single image he shot. We waited for him for every safari because of these backups. Right. Problem is when he went home, he put them all in one bag over his back and off he goes. So one point of failure. So if you are doing multiple backups, just be clever about it and make sure you're not putting them, put one in your hand luggage, one in your carry-on or whatever the case might be, but split them up. Otherwise it ain't going to work. So moving on here, um, Doris asks, what is web and how can I use it? Okay. So if you guys look at, at my interface here, right? If you guys look at my interface here, 
at the top, I've only got library and develop. Now, I only have those two there because those are the only ones I really use inside of Lightroom. But, and I mean, it makes it simpler for me. It's just a nice clean interface. So what, I, what you can do is if you right click next to right library, you get the other ones. Map, book, slideshow. We just open them up all for you. Um, book, slideshow, print, and then Doris, what you're asking about is web. So library, as we know, library is the, um, basically the cataloging and backup system, right? Cataloging, ratings and such. Develop, think of it as Photoshop. This is where you develop your images. Map, if you have a GPS um, enabled camera, you will see all of your images. If you, if you enable that, you will see it here. And you can then zoom in and it'll show you where these images were taken on the map. It, uh, honestly, to me, obviously this is in the Mara. So then I can see where in the Mara each image was taken. So apparently here, up here, some good stuff happened, right? So you can hold over there and you can then look through the images that was taken there. So if you do a lot of travel photography, oh, there's Sammy, this is kind of handy. Um, honestly, never used it. It's gimmicky to me. Um, it's a nice to have. It's not necessary. What I do sometimes do is my iPhone, when I import those, I have a separate catalog. Then it's nice to see around the world where you've taken, took, where you took the image. Um, so yeah, that map book here. You can do a full coffee table book um, directly inside of Lightroom. Um, email me if you have questions. Slideshow is exactly what it says. And it basically allows you to do slideshows of a collection of images. Print. Um, I use this way, way, way back, but so-so. Eh, it's, I prefer to do this in Photoshop manual, but it has value. Here's the one you were asking about, Doris Webb. Now, what this is, and some of my very, 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 very first websites that I ever personally did was based on this. So how this works is you basically come to the top, you select the type of gallery that you want on your website. So for this, you are gonna do one of two things. Either you're gonna build this gallery and upload it to your website, but you're gonna need um, a URL, a domain and such or you can download it as a standalone gallery that you can copy, right? A square gallery or a track gallery, right? You then just work top to bottom. Um, let me just select photos here. Okay. And let me do this. So I'm just gonna select a couple of images here to show you guys. So let's say for example, I choose those. And then you just go top to bottom. What is your website's title? What is this will be Masai Mara, for example, right? Collection description, and you just keep going. Your info, identity plate would be at the back of it. So you basically just complete this from the top to the bottom, and that will create this gallery for you. Now, like I said, it is a little bit old school because you need an old school domain. If you are going to go the web route, right? Email me about SmugMug. And I'll show you that it's way, way, way more powerful. So here we see what this looks like. So this is what your gallery would literally look like on your website. So if you click there, that's what it would look like. And you would scroll through and so on and so forth. Um, and then as you change, you just, you literally just change from the top down and it gives you every single thing and it, it's real time. So you can then see what you are going to get when you upload it to your website. Again, if you're looking for a website, Doris, I wouldn't go this route, a little bit old school. And for me as well, I mean, think about this. Lightroom's DNA is photo editing, right? Lightroom's DNA is not website based. So I would choose to do my website through a company like SmugMug, which is DNA based on photography, if that makes sense. Okay, Web. Um, Alyssa asked, what shortcuts in Lightroom can streamline your process? Lightroom versus Photoshop, what makes Lightroom a powerful tool? Okay, so this I could do for you as well, is if I come into library, right? Um, for those of you that are keen, ask me when I email you tomorrow, ask me about the Lightroom keyboard shortcuts. It's not the newest version, but it still all works. I think it's about 14 pages of shortcuts. There's a lot. So, Alyssa, I'm going to quickly run through as many as I can in a short amount of time. Most important one is G. Wherever you are in the program, G takes you back to this view, which is your grid. Think of it as G, go, go home, 
right? Inside of your catalog uh, library, one through five adds stars. One, two, three, four, five adds different star ratings. Six, seven, eight, nine adds different colors, right? N on the keyboard acts as survey mode, right? So spacebar opens an image, spacebar, again, zoom, spacebar comes out, G to grid. I'm flying through this because there are so many. Okay, the other ones that from here works well are on the keyboard. If you have any image selected and you hit R, it takes you to crop mode. Straight up, there's Sammy, right? So R opens crop mode and R closes crop mode. G, back home, D for develop. So you should be using G and D and R to a certain extent so often that they should be worn off on your keyboard. That's how important they are. So um, email, ch chat to me tomorrow if you want the full PDF. I'll go find it and I'll email it to you guys. And then what was this? Lightroom versus Photoshop. What makes Lightroom powerful? So the the big thing here people must understand this still if i take lightroom and i take photoshop think of those two vehicles right you park them next to each other if you open the bonnet inside the engine is the same whenever lightroom gets updated with new technology so does acr adobe camera raw which is basically photoshop's version to do that shortcuts are the same maybe i should do a webinar on that in the future but the interface of lightroom how it drives is so much easier right? The, the user interface for Photoshop, because it's built around 3D and you can even do video editing and stuff in there, um, it's not as easy as the slider based. So for me as well, library and develop where you spend most of your time, Alyssa, it's all in one. Lightroom, um, Photoshop, you can't in Photoshop go, you got to open bridge and they link seamlessly, but inside of Lightroom, everything you need is in one program. So it's a win. It really is a win. All right, um, moving on here. Guys, if you have any new questions, I will be checking in on the Q's questions a little bit later on, so you can pop them in there. Victor asks, how to use the range mask in auto brush? Okay, Victor, great question. So let us pick something over here. Let, now, range mask is one of the latest additions to Lightroom when they did the latest update. So you'll find the range mask tool in all three of the special adjustment brushes, right? The graduated filter, the radial filter, and the brush. So we'll use the brush for now. Actually, I'm thinking, I'm gonna use graduated filter vector just to show you what it does, and then you can extrapolate that to the brush, right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm select this, and I'm basically now, you turn range mask on, I'll do this, all right? So I've literally highlighted the entire scene. When you brush, you'll do a selection. Now, range mask sits down here. Range mask will affect only the area that is selected. That's why I'm showing you the whole image. You can then extrapolate to the brush. So when range mask came in, you can now select color or luminance. Color, you can choose one particular color and Lightroom will apply the adjustments that you do at the top to only that color, I'll show you now, or luminance is a certain level of brightness. So I'm gonna turn my range mask off, and now I choose range mask, and I say, okay, choose a color. You now take this color picker, and I select something on this image. Let's say I select this nice green down there. Now I turn my range mask on. Watch what happens. So Lightroom has now looked at that entire image, and it has taken only that particular color tone and the adjustments that you make up here will only apply to that area. Watch when I turn my range mask off. So for those of you that are not sure, sorry, the mask is the red areas just show me where the adjustment's going to happen. So I turn that off. Watch now. Anything I do will only apply to those dark areas. Okay. Super, super handy if you want to get different levels and you don't want the entire image to be darker or lighter. It, it, you select it down. Great tool. Now, let's rather go with the luminance option. So what this does is you basically here show the luminance mask. That's the entire image. You now take your color picker and you select a certain brightness. Let's say I select that. Okay, the red areas are the areas that will be processed by whatever I do. Got it? But watch here, the range down here is set automatically. You can fine tune that by pulling the right one, which is the brights, and the left one, which is the darks, closer together. So watch. 
you can fine tune this to only select and process certain errors. So if I do this, I take my range mask off. So I just click there. And now I do, and it only applies to that areas. Okay, watch the range mask on again. The redder it is, the more the adjustment will happen there. If it's just a fine red, not as much. Beautiful way, Vic, to, to blend it in. Because adjustments and light doesn't just go, bah, there it is. It kind of blends in. So beautiful way to do the range mask. Um, I also have a video in which I covered this in a bit more detail, Vic. If you want to ask me in that email tomorrow, I can forward that on to you. Okay. Uh, Wanda wants to know tone curve, when and how. Um, there's another tone curve down there. Okay. Tone curve. Let's go there. Uh, the tone curve is basically, it's under here. Tone curve. Visual tone curve. Okay. Now, Wanda, the same um, video I just mentioned to Vic, I covered this in a bit of detail as well. So you've got the parametric tone curve, and then you can also do one where you select individual points. Now, what the tone curve's goal is, let me do this. If you understand these sliders, blacks, whites, shadows, and highlights, tone curve basically does the same thing, but it can be more detailed. Okay, so if I come down and I choose there, parametric, these sliders are very, very similar to the ones at the top. When you start going to the point-based one over here, I can now add as many points onto this line as possible, and you can play with different tones. Obviously, I'm overcooking it to show you guys, but you can do many things over here. Now, I need you to think about it like this. Um, let me just undo all of those. If you move these four, think of your histogram. Black to white, black first, then shadows, then highlights, then whites. Imagine giving each of them 25 points from zero to 100, right? So blacks, zero to 25, because zero is black. Then shadows from 26 to 50, highlights from 51 to 75, and then whites from 76 to 100. So when you do these, it's kind of a more broader approach. If you come down to tone curve, you can do, instead of 25 points for a slider, you can now go super detailed and, for example, do five points out of 100 and be more specific. Now, you normally won't have to go here. You can, most of the time, by doing all of these things correctly, you can get very, 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 very close to a good result. But it is worth playing with tone curve every once in a while, depending on the dynamic range in an image, how much or little there is. But again, there is a video. I will share it with you tomorrow if you want to dig a little bit deeper there, Wanda. Okay, Tim asked, one master catalog or several? Many advise using a single catalog, but this slows my light trip, even if the catalog is on an external SDD, SSD, solid state drop. Um, Lightroom brags that you only need one uh, catalog. For those of you that don't know, Lightroom works as a catalog. It's basically like a photo album. You can't read two photo albums at the same time. It's confusing. Lightroom can only open one at a time, okay? So when you read one at a time, then the other one's closed. So if you're going to have multiple catalogs, right? Remember this, you have to close one before you open the next. You have to close one before you open the next. Um, if my suggestion would be, if you shoot multiple genres, so let's say for example, you shoot wildlife, you shoot weddings and you do travel photography. I would personally have one for wildlife, for travel and for weddings, for example, right? If you have those, you don't want to see bride, bride, groom, lion, elephant, uh, Empire State Building in one catalog. It's messy. So make one for wildlife, make one for weddings, make one for this. That makes sense to me. If, Tim, you get into a place where your catalog is so big that it's starting to slow your computer down, it must be huge, right? It must be huge. The biggest one I ever heard of, I think the guy is a stock photographer from, from, from LA somewhere had about 800 something thousand images in his catalog and it was apparently still going pretty well. How much do I have? Just out of interest. Uh, my catalog is currently just short of 200,000 and it's smooth. What does all panelists mean again? So all panelists, if you guys are leaving messages, all panelists is basically just me because there's no other people involved. Um, if you guys want to share messages with each other, you can do it to everybody as well. So, um, Tim, 
depending on how many images you have, Tim, I would still try and stick to one. But again, you might have one for 2018 and then do another one for 2019 and so on and so forth. The only problem I would have with that is, I, and I know I sometimes work like that, I'm looking through what I've got here. So I'm looking at this artwork from, from um, Tualu and I'm thinking that's cool, but then I want to write a blog and I need an image from 2015. Now I've got to export this, close this catalog, open the next one. So I personally prefer to have one, right? But um, there's no right or wrong answer. It can be challenging if you want to jump between things, but that gets very difficult. So Tim, um, yeah, hope that helps. Um, what have we got here? So Dan asks, how can I make the most of time spent on Lightroom? Suggested workflows. So Tim, you need to email me tomorrow. I've done a couple. There's, there's, I'm working on a new one as a premier webinar a couple of weeks from now where I'm going to go detailed into kind of that stuff more. But the idea with Lightroom is get in, do what you need to do, get out. Okay? I, I, I'm sometimes fascinated by people who... Say, what have you been doing this week? And I was Lightrooming. Okay, John, but what does that mean? I mean, you, did, you do, did you do cataloging? Did you do editing? Did you just swing sliders side to side? So my suggestion with Lightroom is, and I've been using this as the very first version, get in, do what you need to do, get out. You don't want to get tired of the process. And I think when you go dedicated on your workflow, so I've got a, I've got a beautiful workflow if you email me. Um, just get in, do it, get out. Simple as that. Um, what have we got here? I'm new. Okay, Puja, I hope you got some from that. Um, I've got a question from Turgai. Turgai, hey, hope it's going well. Um, if I sharpen in Lightroom and then in Photoshop, do these two sharpenings add on top of each other? Yes, it does. Okay, but, and I was doing this with a one-on-one -on -one private with someone, I'm seeing her again tomorrow morning, um, talking about sharpening. So, what you must understand about sharpening is not all sharpening is the same. There's actually many parts. So if you do sharpening, right? If you do sharpening, um, then the stuff you do in Lightroom is raw level sharpening. That is not output sharpening. The sharpening you do when Lightroom's export dialogue comes up, that is output sharpening, right? So if you're going to do output sharpening out of Lightroom, and out of Photoshop, you stand the chance of being too heavy. Okay, you stand a chance of being too heavy. So yes, they do double up, but you don't want to do that. You need to understand that Lightroom is raw level sharpening, okay? And Photoshop and Lightroom can be output sharpening. There's a thing. I actually think I did a blog post on that. I'll go find it for you, tour guy. But be careful. Rather under sharpen than over sharpen. It's a big deal. Big deal. Big deal. Okay, um, work on a specific color, Belinda asks. Okay, um, someone is looking for a color. Let me just check here. So to work on a specific color, let's just do something easy. So if the, where is this? Yeah, okay. So if Belinda, you want to work on a specific color, then you're going to come down to color and HSL over here. Now, basic, vibrance and saturation applies to the entire image. It's global. However, for you to go and work on a specific color, you have to go in a bit deeper and you scroll down to color or HSL. Now, HSL stands for hue, saturation, and luminance. Hue basically means what color blue do you want. Saturation, how much blue do you want. And luminance, how bright of that color do you want. So you can either do it this way right? And then you can say, okay, what do I want? Let's work the blue in here. Then you can come to the blue slider and you can only manage that area. Okay. That's a bit psychedelic. Don't do that. Saturation. You can just dial up saturation or then the luminance as in how bright and dark that is. That's the easiest way inside a Lightroom to focus on one particular color. Okay. Um, what have we got here? Tracy asks, Lightroom has not been responding for the last few days on the radial filter and the brushes. So frustrating. Is there a fix? Um, Tracy, there's, there's the last while. I don't know when the last Lightroom update was, but they, they, these glitches do happen. So in the past, I, um, it also depends on what version of Lightroom. Are you on CC 
on the cloud, yeah? Mm. Because then it's pretty easy. Um, uninstall, reinstall. Because sometimes it just gets confused. The desktop one. Um, Tracy, okay, cool, the desktop one. Um, is it the subscription, subscription model where you do it every month? Because then what you can do, okay, cool. So if you go into your, your um, creative cloud, you can uninstall Lightroom and reinstall it, but it'll still keep your Lightroom catalog, right? So you keep all your adjustments, yeah? And um, then you just reinstall it. They, once in a while, they do make changes and it does glitch until the next one. No, it won't lose the edits. So if you delete Lightroom, the program, but you keep LR cat files, which is your Lightroom catalog files. The adjustments that you've made sits in the LR cat files, not in the program. I can take my LR cat files on my hard drive. I can plug it into your computer and I can read my edits. So no, you're more than happy to do that. Um, someone's asking about privates. So, so how does it work? Um, so privates, basically, if you book a private with us, we meet for one-on-one -on -one and work on whatever you want. So, for example, I've been, I don't know if Madhushri's on here. It's a lady from India. We've been working together now for um, about three weeks. And I've got her tomorrow morning again. We just go deeper and deeper and deeper. Great way to work on your own stuff. Ask me if you need any more questions. Okay. Um, what does the tone curve do? We've touched on that. Um, no questions from Raya. Just watching. That's cool. Um, Anne asks, what do you think about presets for wildlife images? Up to now, I don't see a big advantage, but I might miss out on something. Okay, so I am not a fan of presets. I'm not. Why? So, um, and I might have a bit of a rant here as well, but give me a session here. So if I go to this image, for example, and... The presets are down here. So it's color, natural, bright, high contrast. To me, this is the easy way out. The problem is, how many people use Lightroom around the world? Millions, right? So people, okay, vivid, check and done. It's a super easy thing. And if Lightroom was a difficult program, I would think, you know what? Maybe, sure, maybe do presets. It's image based. You might get lucky by clicking on some of these, right? And you can see the previews that you have over. But Lightroom is such a super easy program. Why, do, why don't you need it? It, it? just, I don't know. I don't like it. My big rant is people going on Instagram saying, buy my presets and your feed will look like mine. Uh, no, Sarah, it won't because your preset is designed for your type of photography. Your presets are based on the certain color tones that you want in your images, right? So it's for example, so, 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 what about people that aren't good with Lightroom? So, no, learn Lightroom, be better. <laughs> so Lightroom is an easy thing to learn. Think of Instagram, for example, those of you that are on Instagram, you can take a picture, I can take a selfie, right? And then I go and I can apply those filters. A filter is a preset. So some filters look good on some images, but now how do I know my sable shot's gonna, I don't know. To me, I would just go individual. Right? So there it is. Okay, um, just watch your learning. So I've got the last one from Jane here asks, if I work on the original raw, then make a virtual copy so I can res reset the original. Can I keep the edit history? Yes. Yes, you can. So if you take a virtual copy, so I can take this image with all the adjustments that I've made, I can create a virtual copy with, here's another shortcut, command apostrophe, and it duplicates it, it keeps everything. So if you change this one, this is a standalone file. So yes, you can do that. Pretty cool. Uh, oh, Veronica asked, do you usually change the names of files when importing? So during the import dialogue, you have the option to change the names of the file from whatever your camera, where's my camera, called it. It'll be a number or whatever you decide your camera to call your images. I don't. So if you look at mine, uh, Veronica over here. So my file names, if I put them in the top here for you, um, this keyboard shortcut is I, and what it does is it gives you information over there. So there's the name of the file, underscore 705 dot Olympus raw file. I don't change this. I have no reason to. 
I mean, I could when I import, say, Jerry Fanagold underscore Massamara underscore 2019. But these are raw files. You're renaming 4 million, well, 4,000 files on a good trip. I only rename to what I want at the end of the process. So when I export my files for whatever use it is, at that point, I rename my, um, my files. Um, just a quick one of the Q&A here. Tips on how to export for print, social media, et cetera. Veronica, okay. So the print one, I did a, a print webinar a couple of weeks, months, times all mixed up ago. So email me tomorrow. I'll send you that exactly. There's also a social media one where I sent out a PDF, I think it was, on those, right? And I can, um, I'll send you that as well. But it is important to understand how to export for print and social media. Just from a time point of view now, I'm going to send you those two, uh, Veronica, when you answer my email tomorrow, and I will send those to you. Someone asked, that animal ran through a tar thingy. <laughs> yeah. So this is a buffalo that did a bit of a mud pack, like a beauty treatment on himself. Um, not quite tar, but same idea. Okay. So that is it for now. Guys, so I'm going to stop sharing there. Um, Okay, let me just open the, where's the chat function so I can keep track of you guys. Right, there we are. So, guys, Lightroom is quite amazing, okay? And the questions will never stop. If you have any questions, you know where to find me. Drop me an email, um, give me a message on Instagram, and I'll more than likely be able to point you to a, web, a video that I've done, and you can go from there. Uh, I'm going to email you guys again. I'm going to email you guys tomorrow. And if you answer on that email, please tell me what you're looking for. And I'll try and link them up for you. And you can just go directly into that. If not, we can book a private and we can go from there. Um, Tracy, just if you're scared to reinstall and install, just drop me an email. Um, do screenshot and I can help you through that. It's not that big a deal. Not that big a deal. Um, okay. So for those of you keen on more, what, what webinars have I got left this week? On Wednesday, we're doing Nick filters. Now, it is phenomenal, right? I've done one. We are going super, super, super deep on Nick on Wednesday. It's a plugin that goes into Lightroom and Photoshop, but I'm going to spend all basically of the hour and a half inside of Nick, all of them, analog, noise reductions, all of them. So that's a fun one. Uh, I'll share that on my Instagram tomorrow. Then... On Thursday, I'm doing Seeing Wildlife 2.0. Now, what happens with that is everybody that signs up sends me two of their wildlife images and we talk through them, right? And um, I, I talk you through what works in the image, what doesn't. I use some of mine because we have to be able to see wildlife images. And then next week, Monday, I'm actually doing four webinars back to back. Um, okay, I'm going to talk about that down as is, is, is how to put a portfolio together. So it's going to be, you've got this website with all these images. How do you put your top 10 together? Because it's important. And okay, if someone's giving me a hard time here because I can't talk without my hands. And I know it's a thing. I'm taking tablets, but it's not working. No, it's a thing. I talk like this. Um, guys, as always, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for joining um, if you have questions, I will be sending out that email tomorrow and we can then engage from there, um, get you guys more jacked on Lightroom and see how it all goes from there. So guys, nice to be back three this week, another one next week. I'm also going to be sharing a load of new ones for the whole team. Um, and then I might have Italian genetics in me. See now I talk with my hands now I'm Italian. Yeah, apparently. Okay. Anyway, guys, wherever the world you are, good morning, good evening, and good night. My name is Jerry. I'm from Wild Eye. I will see all of you on the next episode and podcast tomorrow and webinar. Guys, have a good one. Chat to you soon. Bye.